What's going on, YouTube? Earth Power here with Gorby. What's going on, everybody? And, <laughs> better. Much. And we have a discussion video for you guys. Surprise! Yeah. So, uh, the comment section has been lively with the new videos. So, I first off want to To say the guys. least. Yeah. To just thank you guys for being a part of the Duel Masters community, which I didn't know existed. Um... You know, it's really nice to have just all this kind of overflowing support for content, which I honestly just didn't expect. You know, I just kind of wanted to put some up because I thought there were like, I don't know, three fans out there that had just kept messaging me for the past couple of years saying they wanted stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out there were a lot more of y'all. <laughs> messaging all of us, really. Yeah. So. Anyone who had anything to do with the channel at some point has probably received a message. Hey, are you going to make more videos with Earth Power? Yeah. So uh, we'll see. All right. and, and and here we are. You yeah. know, all of those comments and messages finally got on our nerves enough to just make us wanna just make content. So By uh, God. Yeah, so thank you. I mean honestly, like for real, you guys are have, have been incredible and the support has been astounding. I think almost fifty new subs since we started like really? two weeks ago. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Uh, was it like a little under fifteen fifty and we're over sixteen hundred now? Awesome. So um there's thank some you guys yeah, so much. surprising growth out of this uh, for whatever reason this dead card game still exists but either way i keep saying <laughs> negative things because i'm just blown away and i don't know how to deal with things properly so why can't things just be nice <laughs> right so it's it's fantastic it just it really is and i appreciate all of you very very much and uh because of all this, you know, we've gotten a couple comments saying that you guys wanted to listen to us talk to a camera, and you guys wanted to look at a picture while we talked to it, and uh, here it is. There we go. So, we have a couple of topics uh, to bring that, that I've brought up since, uh, you know, we've been getting back into it. A lot of things I've noticed just within the community of Duel Masters, again, that just does exist. I, I'm going to keep saying that because I'm just ever so surprised every time I say it. Yeah, it's, really. it just, you know, it's just mind-boggling. But, uh, yeah, a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest in the content from what I've seen is people with suggestions on, on decks. You know, the, the reason we decided to bring back the channel was because we kind of wanted, like... We all came from Kaijudo, obviously. You know, we, we started playing Duel Masters uh, years ago. Gorby started playing when we kind of you know, started the channel back in, like, 2011 or however long ago it was. Yeah. And, um, you know, we transitioned into Kaijudo, and that was, you know, that's where the channel really took off. You know, it was, we, we built a decent little subscriber base with Duel Masters, and then Kaijudo is what took us over the top, you know, for, for those of you who did stick around, and I'm sure you still see it, you know, just visiting the channel page if, if you do that. Um, there's just a lot of Kaijudo content on the website. And that's sort of, you know, where we came from and where we kind of grew into ourselves as competitive players, you know. Um, I, I can't speak for Gorby, and I'm going to speak for Christian because he's not here right now, but, you know, it's for me as a player, I Kaijudo is what kind of made me realized that I was bad at card games. <laughs> it, to yeah, put, to absolutely, put, absolutely, yes. <laughs> to, to put it in a way, you know. That is an unequivocal yes for me. <laughs> yeah, we just, we we didn't know how to optimize decks. Um, and it was it was a learning process over the course of, you know, two and a half years playing Kaijudo. And then, you know, looking back at it, what kind of revitalized me to jump back into it. First of all, I want to give a shout out to Renault uh, Simpson, Samson. I, I'm, I'm going to get your last name screwed up because I can't remember it right now. But Renald, anyways, he was a um, he, he was one of the few who had messaged me on Facebook, you know, asking about cards and stuff. And he kind of reignited the, the passion to get back into it, um, frankly, because he just bought a bunch of cards from me. But... Um, and force me to get them out of the closet and dust them off. But um, you can't help like like you know kind of think back. You start looking through all this stuff and like, oh man, I remember doing this. Right, and, right. And we should do that again. Yeah, and, and what came out of that, you know, what what came out of that thought process was was me realizing, you know, what would Duel Masters be like with the knowledge we had of Kaijudo. You know, at the end of Kaijudo, I think we had finally gotten a hankering down on how to assess a card correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, to some degree. Like, I still do it wrong in, in all the other games I play, but, you know, it's 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 hard to do right all the time. But, like, for the most part, 
we weren't playing 70 plus card decks anymore and we we sort of gotten away from that with dual masters too you know Yu-Gi-Oh helped us with with that and just kind of realizing how to optimize the deck but you know with in dual masters we were still playing these 50 card like gigantic control decks and and again in years ago like in 2011 2012 before kajudo came out and so the thought process came why don't we build optimized decks why were we dicking around so much with dual master stuff you know mainly because it was just we were just pumping out content left and right so we were just you know stockpiling. Well, I mean, that, that's part of it was that you know the the drive to create content was there so we could afford ourselves you know to make mistakes as long as we enjoyed the content right because uh, well, there was no meta <laughs> exactly <laughs> just the... there, there still technically is no meta i mean the, yeah. the game's dead and realistically it's just us playing each other um, which is why you'll see, like, in deck techs, we, we try not to... Well, we'll touch on this more later, I'm sure, but we yeah. try not to trick out the decks too much. Right. Because it's a three-person meta. Right, right, right. <laughs> we're you playing know. to have fun, not to be the tar out of each other. Right, we're, we're building decks to sort of... If we were taking said decks to a tournament that had more than the people sitting in the kitchen going to it this would be how we would build said deck to compete. Exactly. And that being said, not every deck, and, and again, I get these comments too that like, oh, this deck is, you know, bad or whatever, and it's like, I, I get it. Like, you know, half these decks, like, if there was a tournament tomorrow, I, I don't think I'd play anything but Bombazar, you know, because that's just what the meta was. Yeah. But like, you know, we're building these decks in a way to sort of compete in their own little vacuum, um, mm -hmm. you know, out of 12 sets. Uh so, uh, so again, you know, to, to circle back from that tangent, you know, the, the thought process came, what would happen if we optimize these decks? You know, it's, it's not something we did years ago, or at least we knew how to, you know, we were playing... We thought we had it optimized. Right, we were, we were just playing a lot of weird cards, like Dekalawaz Tanzanite. Like, there were a lot of, like, weird gimmicks in decks that didn't need the gimmick. Right. If, if that makes sense. You know, there were just uh, there were a lot of things that we were playing that we just didn't need to play. Like Marinomancer was just running like infinite cards, foul controls. It still is running infinite cards. We have a deck tech for that coming up. Christian and I, that next night we we put together. The, are we there that yeah. night when we did? We put together foul. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> So yeah, we did a deck it, tech for it a foul. It looked like fairly. It looked like classic duel masters. Right. Not. Yeah. We, it ended up being like fifty cards because we were like, okay, we're gonna tech a bunch of stuff and add like every draw card we can add to the colors. Um, so that's happening. So stay on the lookout for that. But you know, to to that degree, we still like we shaved it down a lot. You know, it, was, it wasn't a fifty-five, you know, fifty-six card deck anymore. It was it was just a solid fifty, you know, enough to where it wouldn't overdraw itself. But that where we could kind of, I don't know what the word is, like tech certain engines, I guess, into the deck. Yeah, incorporate different packages that otherwise we might not necessarily have had before. Right. But even then, you know, it's it's a 50-card deck. Yeah. You know, it's it's still less than optimal. Yeah, you know, because that's the idea. Like, when we talk about optimization, there in, in a deck that has a minimum deck size, like... For Dual Masters, in this case, the minimum deck size in America was 40. You could play as many cards as you wanted in a deck, but the minimum deck size was 40. And when you have... Sorry, guys, we're just plugging up the laptop. Yeah. Give us one second. Yeah. <laughs> when you have deck sizes, when you have a minimum deck size, that basically, from what I've learned just in my you know card game adventures and travels, is that if you're playing more than 40 cards, like if you're playing 41 cards... One card in your deck is strictly worse than the other 40. Yeah. Like, there's always one card in your deck that's worse than the rest. You know, if you, if you put them all on the list, one of those cards finishes in last place. Does that mean you cut that last card? Yes, Not and no. necessarily. Right. Sometimes, you know, yes. Sometimes, sometimes that no. 41st card has a really, really, really good reason for being there. All right. You know, a very niche reason to just, you know, do whatever it does for whatever reason. And, you know, decks can be that way. You know, it's it's okay to include certain packages if it increases the deck size. Like, you know, that, that weighs in very, very much. And a lot of the time it, it would be a, probably a hard no. But sometimes, yes. Sometimes, you know, this package is important to make the deck do what it needs to do. Um, 
So, so that's, I mean, that's my thoughts on optimization. I don't, I don't know if you, what you have to add from all of that. I, I mostly agree. Like, I, from my experience in Kaijudo, because my, my DM experience was basically like your guys's. I didn't compete uh, when the game was still alive, but I, I learned to play the game under the same assumptions that you guys were operating on when we first started the channel. Right. So, uh, for me, optimization was learning what my deck's game plan is and then how I'm going to make that game plan function as smoothly as possible. Uh, and that meant trimming the fat a lot. Yeah. Uh, and there, there's a lot of, you know, fluff cards that are like, okay, well, uh, you look at, um, you look at like rub control from back in the day. It's a 50 plus card monstrosity. That is just jamming cards, the the Tanzanite Declawas combo, and uh, you know burst shots and right. uh, aqua yeah. snipers and all, all kinds of crazy stuff. Server, yeah. So that realistically, rub control. Which you've seen, you've seen the deck. You've seen the the, yeah. the more optimized version. Is it's 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 a more streamlined. I'm gonna hit my curve and I'm just gonna blow out my opponent because my cards are strictly better than his. Right, um, and and again, you know, it's uh, <laughs> talk about fluff cards like Duel Masters. Out of the, I think it's like a thousand and some odd. Someone, I'm sure someone has the exact number. I used to know, but it's been years, and I just don't care. Anymore. Yeah, I mean, Michael, feel free to post in the comments. Yeah, but there, there's, <laughs> there's only like there's a little over a thousand individual cards for Duel Masters out of the twelve set, and it might not even be a thousand. It's probably less than that, but I, I think it's a thousand with promos. I just I can't remember. I remember the number being four digits, but maybe not. Who knows? But either way, there's you know roughly a thousand individual cards, and it's close to almost like eight hundred to eight hundred and fifty of them. Like you know whatever that percentage is, like eighty percent of the cards are just hot garbage. Yeah, <laughs> you know they, they have this one really cool use. Right, like and you, you, you saw with the Survivor Silent Skill match that we just put up. Um, you know, Silent Skill, neat idea, but there are cards that you know. Why would I play a six drop, two thousand power creature that says, you know, while this card is tapped on the board, you can leave it tapped at the start of your turn to return a creature to your opponent's hand? When I have a six drop Shield Blast creature that doesn't have a stipulation on its effect. That just says put this on the board and bounce a creature back to my opponent's hand. Mm -hmm. You know that the the power difference there is just so drastic that like like it just makes those silent skill cards unplayable. Like exactly. <laughs> just... and, and that that's another thing that plays into the optimization argument again is that um, we learned a lot about getting value out of our cards. Right. Uh, and Kaijudo and this is the same is true of Duel Masters. You don't interact with your opponent on their turn. It's just not right you unless, unless you're hitting a shield blast or trigger, you know, which hopefully you're accounting for if you, if you know your meta, right? But, yeah. You know, there's there's no way to interact. Yeah. So cards like the six drop two thousand, leave it tapped. You get to bounce a creature every turn. That's cute, but it's your sixth turn in the game. You're going up to six mana, and you just put a two thousand power body on the board. That has to attack next turn right. to tap itself, survive the blowback from your opponent, assuming you don't hit a blast, and then you leave it tapped on your eighth turn. You wait two turns to start getting value out of those cards. Yeah, and that, that is obscene. Where Surfer comes down on turn six <laughs> and just bounced, does it. You're yeah. done. Yeah, that's Problem just solved. that's the effect that you wanted two turns ago, and there it is. Yeah. And uh, you know, all of silent skills similar to that. And then you know, survivors in that same sort of nutshell. Maybe just you know the fact that they are a little bit more trimmed for what they do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have a decent two drop and three drop that kind of give power to the board, which is ideal for like a mid range strategy. But you know, so survivors is is that. That tier three deck that you'll still see at tournaments. Yeah, it's That'll it's probably the sneak in like an X two. <laughs> yeah, it's the closest thing to being playable. That's a gimmick that the game had. So, yeah. um, but I I, I want to talk about optimization from Kaijudo standpoint just a little bit, and like when when I think we started to figure it out, and I think the tipping point for us 
was Hive Queen. Yeah. We yeah, severely was, underestimated that card. Well, it wasn't Hive Queen so much as it was General Finbar. Um, for those of guess. yeah, for those of you in Kaijudo, General Fin or for those of you from Duel Masters who don't know much about Kaijudo, General Finbar was a six drop, four thousand power creature that said when you summon this card, uh, choose a creature on your opponent's or choose a creature on the board and bounce it back to its owner's hand. And then its second ability read, whenever one of your creatures attacks, draw a card. When your creatures that's not General Finbar. When, or not right, whenever card. one of your other creatures would attack, draw a card. Okay. Um, and that card just severely just annihilated and like basically we call it dirtling when uh when a player is doing stuff that doesn't isn't really relevant <laughs> you know they're just playing uh big fat cards just they're to playing kind of, a six drop two thousand power creature that has to wait two turns to get value right that's dirtling you know that's <laughs> you're doing things like basically the player who dirtles and doesn't get punished for it typically wins mm -hmm. but if you are you know proactive to your opponent dirtling like with cards like Kareel and surfer and you know, you're you're playing, you know, tap effects like Craze Valkyrie or, you know, Kalan to get under your opponent's creatures and destroy them before they get their effects off, you're effectively stopping them from dirtling. You know, you're you're getting under them. You're getting under the dirtle player, if you will. And uh, when you know, when your opponent's dirtling I don't know where I was going with that. What, what did you say? What well, because what <laughs> <laughs> what Carl is getting at. I just said durable a bunch. I just really want to say the word. It's a really fun word. Um, but the the idea is that we transitioned from a reactive play style to a proactive play style you because yes. of Sinbar. Yes. Uh, and it happened over the course of a couple of KMCs. Um, the, the first one, I think, was Hartsville. Yeah, it was, uh, no, it was Massachusetts. It was it was one of them. It was Massachusetts it was, was before Hartsville. Right, it was season one. It was like our mm -hmm. third or fourth game. See, but we it was in Massachusetts. We played, uh, or no, it was Hartsville, because I played uh, Voltail mid range after you had piloted it at Hartsville. Yes. Yes. Um, yep, yep. Yep. And then we finally put the high points in it after. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But we uh, in Hartsville. Carl was the first person we really saw playing Finbar to any sort of success. Right. Uh, and you were only playing one at the time. Yeah. And to tell to tell you guys how important this card became, Carl was playing one at the start of Finbar's life cycle because we thought it was a cool tech card and a way to get around Skull Shatter, which was uh, Kaijudo's Lost Soul. Yeah. Um. Which, you know, discard your land. It's like, oh, well, you know, I'm attacking anyway. I'll just refill my hand after this culture. It'll be no big deal. Um, if you were playing blue, by the time Finbar became relevant, you were playing three of them. Yeah. Every, it was obscene. Yeah, play sets. Kaijudo was three instead of four. But... Because there were still a lot of players who were playing these cards who have to sit on the board a turn or maybe more to start giving right. value. Well, to give you guys another idea, just to, to finish out, you know, the story of how we just evolved as proactive players. But um, in the final KMC of that season that uh, CBH and I went to, it was uh, Mr. Nice Guy Games in Pennsylvania. We, uh, a lot, the popular deck at the time was this 50 card plus uh, force of control monstrosity. It was every color but red, I think. Yep, and, sounds uh, and, and the idea of the deck was it played, you know, three fairy life, three ultimate uh, force, or whatever the card was. Uh, the mana Storm. Mana Storm that, that gave uh, the player two mana on turn Which five. I still think it's the same card in Kajudo, Aaron. It's, it's called Ultimate Force, I think, actually. Okay. But either way, there it, it's, it is the same card in Duel Masters. I think the name's just changed. But in, anyway, all these, like, big control decks were just very, very greedy. They didn't have hardly any early game because players weren't expecting to see any sort of, you know, tempo mid midrange strategy that was going to get under, you know, all their fat cards. Because after turn six, if your opponent was also dirtling, your deck dirtled better, so you won. Like, yeah. that was the idea. But we introduced Hive Queen and this, you know, tempo mid midrange strategy into the meta, and I literally didn't drop a game. You know, I played against one aggro deck my very first round and went 2-1 against it. 
And then after that, I played against control after control after control after control, and every single game was over by turn six. Um, Thinbar and Hive Queen just carried games because okay. the tempo was just too strong. You put down too much force on the board for them to deal with. You were keeping your hand um, alive with cards like Seneschal and Finbar, and it was just nuts. So, yeah, to end, you know, in that the story arc that you were getting at, you know, we just sort of evolved as proactive players. And from that mindset, you know, we circled that back to Duel Masters, and, and here we are, you know, just trying to optimize lists in the way that, you know, Duel Masters will let us. That's why you see cards like Valerica in the Rub Control. Right. Um, I know a couple of players in the comments section, because we do read them, guys, yeah. <laughs> uh, were, were griping about Valerica, saying, oh, it should be this or that bomb or whatever. But no, Valerica is a proactive choice. Valerica says, I know what my end game is, Omedius, and I have not drawn my Bolmedius, let me go get it. While also right. putting another threat on the board. Right, and that's... And that's, I think, what a lot of players don't realize. It's like, oh, well, if you're just playing Valerica, why not play a Bolmidius? And in most most circumstances, again, and this, you know, it's all theory crafting at this point. You know, you can always, you know, play devil's advocate to why a card is or isn't in it. And yes, you know, to understand that, yeah, if you draw Valerica, sometimes you just wish that was already your Bolmidius so you could play it and get on the move. But in some certain, you know, against certain tempo strategies or, you know, other deck strategies, Valerica ends up being, you know, a 7 for 7 body that tutors that other dragon to your hand. And sometimes it doesn't have to be Bali. Sometimes it can be the uh, Bazaga deal that you need. Um, you know, it just it tutors the dragon of choice that you need for that time um, while also providing a body on the board. Because at the end of the day, Valer Valerica, instead of just being Bali, can now be a Valerica and a Bali, you know. Yep. So it's it's important to understand that, you know, not, like, I, I don't know what the best way to put it. Like, you know, cards that tutor like that are important mm -hmm. um, for the reason that, you know, they create, they're, they're floating. Mm -hmm. And, and Valerica is, is a big floater. <laughs> the, the, this goes back to the, the earliest, earliest days of card games. Where plus ones of attrition will win you games. Yeah. You know? Uh, Bolmedius is inherently just a minus one. You put it down into your hand, and it has to sit there and hopefully survive a turn. But if it does survive a turn, great, your end game is now in effect. Right. But... Uh, and, yeah, and it's not necessarily a minus one. It's just a... Well, not a minus one. Right. It's just a, a card that isn't impacting the board immediately. Mm -hmm. And then that's that's the big lesson that we really hope you guys take away from at least this section of the video is that what we are looking to do is change, not necessarily change, but demonstrate how we've learned uh, impacting the board immediately is just that much more important right. in, in this style of game where you don't get to interact with your opponent because they don't get to answer it. Yeah, <laughs> it's just that it's that simple. You don't you don't get to respond to my Kirill and say no you can't. Right. And, no, and my Kirill comes into play and shuts down whatever you're doing and that's that. And that segues us perfectly into what my next topic was gonna be is just low impact versus high impact cards. Yep. Um, and Duel Masters is just a notorious game for it because I mean at the end of the day, when you look at Duel Masters on paper, if you're not running water, your deck's probably not good. Um, <laughs> which is very disappointing really um, because, you know, Aqua Hocus, Kareel, um, and then in certain strategies, Emerald, Aqua Surfer, and Energy Stream, like those five cards hold such a grip on this game that, to you know... To a lesser extent, Merfolk. Or to, right, of course, and that's what I'm saying with, with certain cards like that would run Emerald for, you know, control reasons, mm -hmm. but, you know, every deck at the end of the day is probably running... Aqua Surfer and Kareel, um, if it's running water, because those two cards are just probably the two most powerful cards in the game, uh, with the exception of, you know, Bombazar, but we pretend that that doesn't exist a lot of the time. Oh my God. And, uh, you know, it's just, when, when two cards exist like that, you know, Aqua Hocus being, you know, three mana, 2,000 power, so I'm going to draw a card. Um, it's a body that trades favorably with almost everything else in its class at that level. Um... 
and and also floats. You know, it's it's an inherent plus one um, because it's drawing the card and probably taking something with it on its way out. Um, how do you top cards like that? Realistically, you can't. Right, I right. Mean, you, 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 it's very, very difficult to like a lot of the time. You're, you, you know, even if you're killing it on board, you know, if, if you've got something with three thousand or more power that's attacking over the Hulkus, you know, it's fine. You know, Hulkus has already gotten its value. Hulkus, you know, for a lot of those strategies, especially in control, you know, that's that's the whole reason it's there. It's just there to tutor a card and 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 force your opponent to you know, do something about it, you know, deal with it in a, a way that they probably don't want to efficiently. And to, to briefly revisit the optimization discussion, not to keep beating this horse, but um, that, that's another reason Hulkus is so important and cards like it are so important because in a, a fully optimized deck, those cycle cards get that much better. Right. Because you're drawing things that you want to see more often. You're drawing your problem solvers and your matchup deciding cards. Whereas if you're playing a 50 plus card control deck, it's like, oh, well, uh, I really need to draw a Foul Eager here so I can cycle back this Terror Pit and kill my opponent's thing. And uh, it's my fourth cranium clamp. Yeah, you know, like. Sorry. Yeah. Again, well, with you deck know, laws, I really don't need this right now. Right, like like you said, you know, for as, as far as optimization is concerned, like you know, fifty cards, ten cards in this deck probably are just worse than the other forty. Exactly. So you know, you need to dull those numbers down. And Hulkus, at the end of the day, is getting you to those cards that you want to get to. You know, Hulkus isn't. By, by is upwards it, of a 20% margin. Right. You know, and, and that's <laughs> but that's what I was going to say. The Hulkus isn't winning games. Hocus is helping you win the game faster. <laughs> you know, it's, exactly. it's getting you through your deck while also providing a body that, you know, can potentially attack. You know, in this game, every creature, you know, your opponent's only got five shields, and every creature breaks one of those. And Hulkus being able to float, be an inherent plus one, and also help you get towards that end game and certain tempo and 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 we keep saying tempo, we'll get to that in a minute. That's mm -hmm. that's something that just sort of Something yeah. kind of judoism. Yeah, well, it, it eats at me every now and then when people say it the wrong way. But you know, when when you've when you've got a tempo strategy in effect, you know, Hulkus is just incredible. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's it's just it's so powerful in that strategy, and then it's so powerful in control strategies because again, like I said, it's providing a body that is forcing your opponent to do something about it or just leave it there and then eventually it ends up just being an attacker and that that's overwhelms your opponent. And with your opponent. <laughs> right, yeah. And then... So you're not uh, getting blown out. Yeah, and then an aggro too. You know, if, if aggro is running water, like, the card just gets run because it's just so good in that way. Exactly. So, you know, when, when cards like that exist, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to, I guess, focus a meta around other cards. Like, it, it just makes decks like Silent Skill, like Survivors, like Wave Strikers, like, you know, all these other gimmick strategies just not viable without running that same engine. Right. And so it just, you know, that's just card space. And then when you're already running that engine, it's like, well, why don't I just run these other better cards? You know, it's just, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a very interesting meta. Mm -hmm. The Duel Masters has created for itself where we just got so many powerful staple cards and Duel Masters just never did it justice in the 12 sets that the game was out to make those cards not as playable. Right. You know, like, Science Skill could have been great if they just increased the power on all the Science Skill creatures by, like, I don't know, Two thousand. Three or four thousand for you know whatever depending on yeah how, how whatever level the creature was so like and it goes back to that very first example you know six thousand power or six drop two thousand power that has to sit on the board for two turns before it starts doing stuff right when there's already a six drop two thousand power creature that does stuff when it hits the board and you know and again that's high impact versus low impact aqua surfer very high impact because it affects the board immediately when it hits the board. And Neuron, whatever the hell card, the, the I don't know what it's called, the science skill six drop that bounces it's again. It's not worth naming. Right. Pinpoint Lunatron, that's it. Well, we named it. Right. <laughs> that card is very low impact, because it doesn't do anything for two turns until you get it off the, you know, starting off. 
And then, you know, I, I've noticed in a few comments just in a couple of past videos recently, cards like uh, Spiral Gate, Mysterios, um, Photo Sideworm, um, all cards that have great potential. Like, you know, when <laughs> in a vacuum, when cards are left unchecked, like when a Photo Sideworm is left unchecked, yes, that card is very good. Um, you know, light sees play in the majority of um, powerful strategies because of, you know, Magris, Sarius, Craze Valkyrie, Holy is, all. Yeah, Holy All. I mean, those, those four cards provide one of the best packages uh, in the game in terms of, you know, you know, you've got a solid draw card, you've got a, one of the best two draw blockers, and both those cards evolve into one of the best evolutions in the game, and you're provided with one of the best shield blasts in the game just out of four cards. Um, so that package sees itself in play in almost every light strategy, and Photoside Worm gets over on all that. The problem with Photoside Worm is that it's a five drop. The problem with Photoside Worm is that when you play it, it doesn't do anything for a turn. The problem with Photoside Worm is that when comparing it to the other five drops in its class, um, namely Kareel, it loses to it every time. Yep. Um, so it's just it's hard to assess a card like that or warrant putting it in a spot when other decks that you know are, are just not even other decks but other cards in that color, um, locomotive for instance, high impact. You summon it, it gets its effect immediately. Cranium plant, very high impact, shuts your opponent's strategies down almost completely if you drop it on turn four. Yep. Um, Terror pit, very high impact. It's just a one for one best one of the best triggers in the game. Um, you know, all just very powerful cards in Darkness, and, you know, it provides the engine that you play in almost every Darkness deck. And then when you're looking at each one of these packages, Duel Masters at the end of the day, you know, there's probably like 40 or 50 cards out of the five civilizations, and then the multi civ cards, you're kind of just mixing and matching each of these packages, putting them in a deck, and calling it a day. Yeah. You know, that's, that's Duel Masters in a nutshell. And it's, it's very boring. I don't know why you guys like this content so much. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> shit. Because <laughs> that—that's what Duel Masters is. You know, it's just it's these, it's these same packages from each color, and then we're just combining two to three of the colors at a time, and you know, just throwing yeah. them at each other. I mean, there, there, there's cool exceptions like um, I think Hydrus is pretty viable. Yeah. Uh, because you get to see a couple more niche cards out of it, things like that, but. Uh, yeah, ultimately, the, the discussion becomes we, we understand high impact, and these high impact cards get seen a lot. Right. Um, but in order for your low impact card, meaning that it doesn't do anything right away, right, to we're, have we're, a, not, we're not immediately influencing the board in some meaningful way that pushes us that much closer to victory. Uh, your low impact card has to have a really, really good reason for you to be playing that card. Right. Because it has to stick around. And that means if I get this card to stick, I'm probably going to win. Right. And cards that come to mind like that, Volmedius, right. Cryptic Totem. Even Techno uh, Totem. You Techno -totem. Guys, yeah, you guys have seen the junk deck that we put together. You know, we got a lot of not negative response to it, but like a lot of interesting response it's like to it. confused. Yeah. <laughs> and the, it's just like, how is, you know, this deck is just, it's got to be bad because it's not running blue. And it's like, to a degree, yes, but, you know, that's that's the idea is that, you know, you guys saw it in one of those matches. When Techno Totem starts going, like if they drop Techno Totem on, you know, Spectre Horn hits on three, Techno Totem hits on four, and. Uh, and Petrova comes down. And Petro if Petrova hits on five, you know, if that, that three card progression right there is almost unstoppable if you don't get under it or over it at some point, you know. Um, because the deck's also running cards like Cranium Plant and Locomotive to disrupt what your opponent's doing. So cards like that, you know, have... I do like the suggestion of Lukey Alex for that deck. That yes. Sidebar. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, that was probably just a mistake. We didn't have Lukey Alex with us. I don't know what happened to my play set of Lukey Alex. They just, I don't know. But yeah, that card probably needs to be in there for Spectre Coin. So good catch. Uh, Whoever you are. Guy, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the you know all, all those cards in a vacuum are low impact because they're not affecting the board immediately, but their strategy contained among themselves is so overwhelmingly powerful that it makes the deck viable. And then Cryptic Totem just as a, you know, 
as a you know f a final additional piece to that deck. You know, Cryptic Totem plus four other creatures. If they all get attack over on your opponent's board, you win. Like it's just you can't play any triggers. <laughs> the game's over. You know, and uh, so so it's it's interesting to see. You know, we, where we talk about all these you know high impact versus low impact, and you know I, I play. I don't mean to sound like a broken record to a lot of you know people in the comment section because I, I am replying to a lot of people. I'm, I'm telling Gorby this now. I don't know if he knew that I replied to almost everybody who comments on the videos. Oh yeah, I see it. But yeah, you know, I, I try to respond to almost all of you when you do comment. You know, within a day or two, because um, I go through them every night before I go to bed. But um, you know, I'm not trying to sound like a hard ass. I'm not trying to sound like I'm. Like, I, I'm just trying to hit it and play devil's advocate to you in hopes that you'll come back at me with a constructive argument. Because um, that's, that's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm just trying to learn and get better. You know, I, <laughs> for a dead card game, obviously. But, like, you know, there's there's definitely still room to grow. Um, Absolutely. You know, in, in anything you do. And Duel Masters is no exception. You know, I, I want to optimize these decks. I see myself playing this game at least for the next couple of months, you know, just to make content for you guys again because I'm enjoying it. But, you know, that when, when I, you know, come at certain cards, you know, when, when I get suggestions like, oh, Mystery I should be in here because it draws cards. I'm like, well, you know, yes, the card says it draws cards, but it's so slow, and it's a 5 for 2,000 power creature. It loses to almost every fire spell. It gets bounced by every, you know, water spell. Like, when I'm already playing a deck with such low-impact cards that need to kind of snowball to get their, you know, power off, I don't want to add an additional low-impact card that's even more low-impact and not really affecting the overall strategy that's trying to take place, if exactly. that makes sense. So, I don't know what you have to add to that. I, I need no, water. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it makes good sense. I mean, you know, this, and this isn't so much to um, tell you guys that, you know, this is how you should play the game. Right, you guys are doing it wrong. I love, yeah. love, love, love seeing we, we do, like, occasionally, you know, you cap some stuff that we could genuinely improve on, like the Luke Elex in the, uh, in the junk deck. Um... This, this is where we're coming from with our experience uh, across multiple card games, across multiple years, traveling, you know, learning different things. Um, but, you know, ultimately, this, this is how we want to show you guys that there might be a better way to play the game. Uh, and we, we realize that, you know, saying, making a claim like that... Uh, Especially given, you know, that the game is not alive, uh, is, you know... <laughs> Can't say that enough. It's kind of ballsy, yeah. but... I mean, to, to that degree, too, I've, I've noticed what a lot of players are saying, um, you know, that, that some people still play on TCGO, which but, is, you know, the online trade card game. I guess there's a Dual Masters download, so people have downloaded the cards for it and still play there. Um, and I saw a lot of comments saying, oh, you know, if... You know, these cards are so good, and you're claiming that they're this good, and this is why you're playing them. How come I never see these cards on TCGO? And it's like, okay. <laughs> you know, that's... I, I've i never... And, and let me just put this out there right now. I've never enjoyed conversations with anybody, you know. And, and I try to do this myself as well. You know, just me trying to be a better, you know, kind of... You know, that, that person who walks with a little bit of humility... I never try. I, I don't like people who are so confident in believing in a thing that they kind of disbar everything else that's in their way. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like you know, saying I never see this card anywhere else. So why do you think you know why it must not be good? And it's like, well, you know, I I don't. <laughs> I understand your your point. But, you know, it's try to think with an open mind here. Maybe this card has this way. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of it, you know, in, in your way as well. But, you know, for me to, for, for me, like when someone's like, hey, you should play Mystery Ops. Or, hey, you know, Photoside's good. Hey, Spiral Gate should be here instead of something, you know, here. Don't just tell me that. Put some thought into it. Yeah. You know, I, I, like, I like reasons. I like theory crafting in that, in that way. To where it's like, this is why 
you should be playing this card because it's good in this, this, and this situation. And and if those situations are good enough to warrant playing them, then you know, sure, yeah. we'll give it a shot. Like to, to take the example for of a photo side worm, um, uh, the person who commented was particularly enthusiastic. They really liked the idea of that card. Right. Uh, said you know it kills craze and blah blah blah, and that, that's that's all well and good, man. You know it. If you can get that photo side worm to stick, good job. Yeah. But think about the cards that are occupying that same sort of time frame when Photoside comes down. If it's your turn five and you play a Photoside Worm, it's going to be my turn five after the fact. And I could just curl it away. Could curl it away. Um, or if it's your turn five and I'm on the and I'm on the draw, it goes to my turn six, I can Aqua Surfer it away. Right. Or, or I can Terror Pit it. Or right. I can uh, I don't know, natural snare if you're feeling squirrely. <laughs> well, you know, even then, it's uh, you know to to kind of play devil's advocate to your arguments now for you know reasons for soda the photo side just to have a dialogue with you for a minute. Sure. You know it's it's okay. So you say that I play photo side, but cards like terror pit and natural snare exist. Well, then the same could be said for any five drop. That's a fair point. <laughs> uh, my question. To you after that would be, okay, why are you playing those other five drops? Right. And then that's where the dialogue, you know, kind of takes that shift. And as far as theory crafting goes, you know, what's your deck trying to accomplish by turn five? You know, in in this case, if you're playing photo side and your opponent's playing an aggressive strategy, you've just pit played a low impact five drop that won't be able to and again, photo side can just all photo side says is that it can attack on tap like creatures. Can't break shields can't do anything else. <laughs> it's just 5 for 9,000 power. Can attack on top of light creatures. Yep. Neat. So that's really good when your opponent's playing a light deck that's dirtily. Very, very good in that situation. But if you play photo side on turn 5, and I've got 3 other creatures on my side of the board that are coming at your face, and you haven't done anything else in those you know previous 4 turns to really kind of stop my tempo-y progression... Photo side's probably the best thing I want to see on five. You know, it's just it's something that's not affecting my game plan immediately against yeah. you. Um, and the same can be said for cards like Mystery Oss, you know, and, and a deck that's trying to dirtle like uh, like junk mid range slash control is, you know, Mystery Oss is or, or even Mystery Oss's best deck, Diamond Cutter. Yeah. It's just it's very you know, there, there's already enough cards in that deck that are cycling for you that do it better than spending all of your turn five to play a card that doesn't have an effect immediately when I could be doing more to set up a strategy that could win. It's like Mystery Us is kind of deterring from that. Like, sure, it's great. If you've got the time, like, if you've got a whole turn five to just play a card and not have your opponent react to it, yes, Mystery Us is nuts. But... You know, in, in a game where you know you're having a back and forth with your opponent, playing cards like that are kind of just a welcome invitation to your opponent to say, "Hey, I'm not doing anything. You know, <laughs> come at me." <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's it's pretty great. Um, you if, know, if you see. want if you want a great example of dirtling getting punished, watch the Survivor <laughs> versus Silent <Sinatra. laughs> Uh, and I'm not I'm, choking I'm not saying that just because I'm old. Uh, <coughs> yeah, but I the mean, cards Carl was playing were just so ridiculously slow. ineffective and slow that I was able to I, I dirtled better than Carl did. Yeah, well, I, I got my engine going and then I broke all five of his shields. Yeah, well, that's, one, not, that's the thing. You didn't even dirtle. You just you played cards that could attack. <laughs> Well, the thing is, I, didn't, I, didn't, I chose not to attack with them because I really wanted to get Qtronic off, yeah. and I knew that I could do that because your your deck's not doing anything. Yeah, it wasn't. And so, yeah, it's just it's important to think of cards in that aspect. You know, yeah, Duel Masters is full of a lot of cute cards that do cute things, but in a game that's so immensely... I'm trying to think of what the word is, but just exhausted with, you know, cards that already have such high impact value. Mm -hmm. 
you know, playing playing these very low impact cards is just almost always it's too much of a risk. Yeah, it's just it's just not good. You know, it's and that's that's what we were trying to avoid coming back into the game. Like, you know, I, I'm more than happy to, to play some cards for kicks. Mm-hmm. You know, just just to dick around. Like, you know, Mystery House deck, it's probably fun. You know, it's I I don't disagree that it's fun. But like the half the reason why I wanted to start making content again for the channel was because I didn't want to dick around so much and not say you know it's a dead card game who the hell cares but like i i wanted to optimize Duel masters i wanted to kind of showcase it through a new lens right i, I wanted to bring Duel masters to light in the way that if you guys were seeing decks you know t- today like if there was a big ass tournament tomorrow like hundreds of players showing up to this thing everybody's been you know working on strategies and going to tournaments and, you know, building, you know, and optimizing their decks for X amount of months to play this tournament and, you know, there's some sort of prize at stake. Going down to Wilson and playtesting in the hotel until 3 in the morning. Right. Four hours of sleep and eating some McDiesels in the morning. These would be the decks that you would see. You know, that that's what I want. I would show up with confidence to a tournament playing that light water tempo deck that we showcased. Right. It, it's a good deck, you know. People would show up in troves playing Bombazar, and if Bombazar was banned for said tournament, I'd bet people would show up in troves playing the the Water Fire Nature tempo you know, aggro deck. Mm-hmm. So, and, and that's another thing too, just to talk about. You we'll, know, we'll touch on that. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're almost there. <laughs> so we're we're coming to the end of this segment. Right. So to to recap quickly, we wanted to optimize the game. We wanted to demonstrate high impact versus low impact value. And ultimately what that helps us do is explain risk versus reward. Because any sort of competitive anything, where it's you versus your opponent, there's risk and there's reward. Um, For you fighting game fans, uh, because this is where most of my competitive time has been recently, uh, you look at... um, the uh, Evil Moment 37. I'm sure a lot of people have seen it. It's the uh, You're Ken talking to a primarily European base. Yeah, well, European yeah there's players. a lot of fighting game players in Europe. Okay, sure. <laughs> France has one of the strongest King of Fighters 13 seats. Alright, well, um, hopefully you guys are getting this reference. A lot of people have seen the, the Daigo Parry, where Ken parries the full Chun Li super and everyone goes nuts. In that game, the Chun-Li Super is fast. It's mostly, it can be punished, but at the life total that that Ken was at, it should have just chipped him out and killed him. And Justin Wong, the Chun-Li player, knew that there was very, very little risk to him just banging out the Super and trying to go for the kill. He got punished. Paired the whole thing. His opponent did a combo that killed him, and that that's that's a low risk, high reward scenario where it, it didn't pay out. And if you're playing photo side against my light water tempo deck, you're taking a high risk, low reward scenario yeah. where I can and, punish you super super hard. Right, and and it's, it's and that's that's what we want you guys to start understanding is that. Um, not, not to sound like I'm, you know, your dad or something. Right. I need you to understand this. Uh, <laughs> right. There's, there's no, there's no pretentiousness here, and we welcome all, you know, you know, if you've got a relevant argument mm-hmm. and you have something meaningful to say to the dialogue that Gorby and I are just kind of going back and forth with right now, please comment it below. So yeah, I want to hear it, but you know, I, I want it to be relevant. You, if you guys are just going to come in and say no, like. Oh, okay, <laughs> but you know if, if you've got tried. right, you know if you've got something you know productive to say to this argument, you know if you've got if you if you want a theory craft and go back and forth, I'm more than happy to you know go back and forth with you, but just prepared for me to come back at you, <laughs> you know, and and it's not in a negative way. I just you know I enjoy these dialogues, so but go. that that's mostly where we're coming from. Uh, as card game players now is what is the risk of me playing this card versus what's the payout? Because at the end of the day, nine times out of ten, the low risk, high reward option 
is going to net you the gain. Yeah, it's it's called you know it's it's the theory of being reward or uh, results oriented. Results oriented. I always said rewards oriented. <laughs> so, you know, when you get a lot of rewards, you're happy. As uh, if, if you want to learn more about results oriented uh, thought, please watch some of our previous discussion videos. Yes. Um, you know, being results oriented uh, in almost every other avenue of life is how you just want to be. But it's a whole different side of a coin in card games because, you know, if you get this result but you can't really explain why you got this result or, you know, this result happened one out of X games so you're going to play this, you know, like Photoside, you know, you're nine times out of ten, you know, nine times, or, you know, one time out of ten, Photoside is just going to carry a game because it's going to destroy all of your opponent's light things and your opponent's not going to be able to do anything else. But the other nine games, it's going to get bounced, it's going to get removed, it's going to get, you know, swung around when, you know, you're better off playing something else that impacts the board immediately. And that's, you know, that's what we're trying to get you guys to avoid, is just being that sort of results-oriented, you know, player where it's like, oh, but Photosite carried the game this one time. It's like, yeah, maybe that one time. In, but... in a 10-round Swiss tournament. Yeah. Do you want Photoside to have a really good performance one game, but you still go 1-9? and nine? Right. Or do you want to go 9-1? and one? Right. Not and saying that not one. Right. Not saying that one card is going to do that to you, right. but you know, you, you have to kind of you have to assess all of your cards and your deck as a whole when you're, you know, thinking that way. And a lot of these cards that we see you guys suggesting, I like them if the mechanics of the game were slightly different. Yeah. Not to create like a whole new topic, but brief sidebar. Yeah, we, well, um, we were getting into that earlier, and we can talk on that now because I think we're about to transition anyways. Because if, if we had, you know, something like a main phase two where we could ensure that our new strategy was protected, uh, or if we had more interaction between players, or or if uh, you could send multiple creatures to destroy other creatures. Yeah, exactly. You know? Or or a sideboard. You right. know? Like, I, I think Photoside is a great sideboard card. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you're, Probably if you're in darkness, just one of the best. If you're in darkness and you're really worried about your opponent, uh, let's say you're playing Rub and you're really worried about Taj Mahal eating your bodies alive, throw a Photoside in there. Eat that Taj Mahal. Who yeah. cares? Yeah. But, you know, this, these, these are cards that are good in a vacuum and that are good in games that aren't dual masters right they're they're good in select <laughs> matchups and otherwise are great you yeah. know it's it's you know it's, it's tough to it's tough to, to it's tough. assess cards that way you know it's in, in a game that like we said you know is just so exhausted by just how high impact very few select cards are that almost every other card in the game is unplayable you know it, it's just kind of it, it's a boring game dual masters on paper boring like, just yeah. very unwell built. You play the best <laughs> card in your hand every turn, and well, yeah. we'll see what happens. Like, I'm sure the game's evolved a ton in Japan, and, and please, you know, if, if you've got something to say about the Japanese game, like, I'm all about reading it, but I'm not I'm not buying Japanese cards, guys. We're not playing Japanese cards. Can't do it. This, <laughs> this channel sets 1 through 12 in English only with promos. Like, don't... Uh, you might and, have seen Japanese cards in the Bali deck profile, but don't get excited. Yeah, uh, the bombs are, but yeah. They are, they are strictly for... Uh... Just for show. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, don't We're not we're not doing Japanese stuff, doing guys. Cool, I'm, I'm very reluctant to sell cards. Um, I mean, so much so to where I just, I'm saying that because I don't want to deal with the messages anymore. But, you know, feel free to ask. If, if you have a list in mind of cards that you're after, post that with it so that I don't have to ask. Um, and that way I can just say yes or no. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not really selling cards. I may buy cards if the price is right. Like, there's a handful of cards in our little playgroup right now that we're missing. So, you know, I wouldn't mind having physical copies. But I'm not willing to shell out hundreds of dollars for them. So, yeah. you know, that that's up to you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Just if you to, really want to buy a place out of a photo side worm, by all means, hit Carl up. Yeah, I'm, I'm there. I've got them. I've got them in troves. But if you want us to come off our place out of promo holy Oz, yeah, we're holding on to those. Yeah, they're not going anywhere. Better luck next time. Yeah. So, so on that note, um, you know, we will transition uh, a little bit 
Um, we were talking uh, just a second ago, and now it's gone. Mechanics. Not mechanics. We were. Two creatures attacking one. Nope. I know you said you wanted to touch on that. Uh, yeah, well, we did a little bit, and that was fine. Yeah. Uh, I'm a bad host. <laughs> I'm lost. I'm sorry. Oh, we're talking about it. I'm sure we'll get back to it. But uh, I do have uh, basically what, uh, what I wanted to finish this little dialogue with was uh, what we have in store for the future. Um, just to give you guys sort of an idea of what you can expect. Um, we will be doing a lot of matches, a lot of deck techs. Um, basically, if we build a deck and we play it on camera, we'll probably deck tech it for you. Because um, that's the idea. That's that's what I'm trying to give you guys. It's just enough content to where if you are playing in your play groups, which I've noticed a lot of you are, like holy shit, you know that's just incredible to know that people are still playing this game elsewhere. Yeah, really. But um, you know that that's what we're trying to build this. Um, that's what we're trying to uh, you know build this channel towards is people who are still playing the game, just trying to give you guys some neat ideas to play around with and something to bounce know, around your own group and have fun with. Right, just some decks to try and you know play with and you know build towards and etc. Uh, so that's what basically what we'll be doing. Uh, I have taken a handful of your suggestions and decks that I plan on bringing to the channel include a Balam control. Um, because that seems like a lot of fun, and it's funny because we just gave Photoside a lot of shit, but I'm pretty sure it's going to end up being in the deck. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens. Because it's a 5 for 9,000 attack creature, and that's just kind of good for sticking around for Blum. So There you go. Um, so that'll, that'll be a deck that I think we'll probably try to mess around with a little bit. And then uh, Lightfire Rush is another deck, uh, just because I think Larva Gear is kind of nuts. Mm -hmm. and I think aggro as a whole is really bad, and that's it. The idea just came back. Um, the triangle, if you will, the lightning of, grip. Of, of, of decks, you know, the whole control mid-range aggro uh, anomaly, um, and how we use tempo in a very casually wrong way. <laughs> yeah. Tempo, for those of you who don't know, uh, is not a deck type. <laughs> It is a strategy. Um, keeping tempo with your opponent is basically my opponent plays a two drop. I play a bigger two drop. I have tempo. <laughs> I have board tempo. Like my strategy is now making my opponent react and respond to me. Is this um, the same way you apply that in chess? Right. No. You, you are making your opponent, you are assuming control of the game. Right. Tempo says, I'm in the driver's seat now. Yes, and and ideally, again, nine times out of ten, you know, however many times out of however many times, when a player has tempo, they are typically in a winning position, and tempo shifts with you know certain high impact plays that would shift said tempo over to the other player. Christian so, casually refers to these as swing terms. Yes, yes. So, and that's you know that's what tempo is. Um, tempo is not a deck type. Um, and I need to go back and stop putting it in decks because we say it a lot and I think it's just an easy way to reference a deck when we're talking about it because I think a lot of you who have watched us for so long kind of know where we're coming at. But, um, you know, for anybody else from the outside looking in, they probably just think we're idiots because, you know, these, these don't exist. Um, when looking at decks like the, uh, like Bombazar. Bombazar is not a tempo deck. Bombazar is not a mid-range deck. Bombazar is an aggro deck, you know, even though it's curving out, it's like, oh, seven drop cards aren't aggro, it's like, well, any deck that's applying constant pressure to the face that isn't stopping is aggro. <laughs> you know, that's just what it's doing. That's why you can go back to, for reference for other games, if you guys are maybe having trouble, like, understanding where we're coming from in DM, um, in Hearthstone, with the first adventure that came out, the next Ramus adventure, we gave or it gave birth to uh, Death Rattle Hunter, which was the premier aggro strategy of its time. It was nearly unstoppable with the uh, Undertaker coin Leper Gnome start. Um, but the premise of the deck was that it just goes at your opponent's face and does not care. 
Uh, and the deck curved out at six mana because of Savannah High Main. That's it's a high impact. Well, it's low impact because it doesn't do anything. But uh, it says answer me right now. Yeah. Um, and you you still curve out at a fairly high point in your mana count, but ultimately it's the strategy of the deck. Yes. And that that's where these names come from. Right. And control wants to control the flow of the game. Right. Agro wants to dictate the pace of the game and by just hitting you. Right. And it's more it's more acceptable to call these decks like for Bombazar, for instance, it's more acceptable to call it like water fire nature agro tempo. Like tempo should be an an add on like kind of just like the adjective that describes said deck. Mm -hmm. Um because you have certain mid-range strategies, and then you have certain mid-range tempo strategies. You know, mid-range decks that kind of focus more on their middle game, that aren't as aggressive early, but kind of tempo out on your opponent towards the end and snowball and beat them. Um, I think the light nature deck that we, or the light water deck, right. kind of falls into that category. Yes, yes, it's more of a mid-range tempo because it's it kind of wants to take favorable trades early on. And then, and then just blow you out. Kind of, race. yeah. Just hit them with blow after blow after turns like five and six, just to kind of seal the game away. So, yeah, that's that's kind of where we're coming at. And I just wanted to clarify that. But yeah, as far as uh you know future goes, what you guys can expect from us as we begin to wind down this discussion video, um, a lot more deck techs, a lot more uh, matches. You know, I think that's what uh, you guys have been enjoying. Uh, please comment below what you'd like to see. Um, you know, other types of content, if there is anything else. Um, I wouldn't mind doing another one of these discussion videos probably in like, you know, a handful of weeks once we kind of exhaust this one. If we come up with more things to talk about, if you guys have suggestions or things you'd like for us to talk about, then... Or things uh, that you've heard here that maybe you want us to expand on a little more. Yeah. Like, that's one thing I noticed about Bombazar, just to go back, is that, you know, <laughs> we made a mistake. Um, a lot of players who were who don't know what Bombazar is, assume that when we put Bombazar on the board, the game was over. And it's like, no, not necessarily. Like, Bombazar is just so powerful that, you know, if you set up for it correctly, yes, it wins the game almost every time it hits the board. But you can't just raw summon it and win the game. No. And that's what we failed to... It, we, we were just so... Annoyed with the card, I guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, it, it, it gets it's, tiresome it's playing a against it. Because... Right. It's a very love-hate relationship with the card because it is just so degenerate. Yeah. But it's uh, it doesn't just win the game on its own. You do have to set up a strategy around it. So yes, you know, if they, to, to Gordy's point, if there are things that we need to explain better uh, that you would like us to explain or, or expand upon, please comment that below. We, we'd love to hear. Uh, back from you guys and, and just overall if you guys have actually managed to listen to us talk for an hour um, you know tell us what you thought um, you know I, like I said I'm more than happy to have a dialogue with you guys if you're willing to have a dialogue like I, I will respond to almost every comment but you know if if you have something relevant that you know you want to talk about then you know be prepared for me to kind of play devil's advocate to whatever you're saying yeah. so that we can kind of reach you know kind of a give and take you know i i like i like productive arguments um, it needs to be meaningful right you know i i like you know if you know what you're talking about and you have legit you know backings as to why you're suggesting certain things you know i will more than happy i i'm more than happy to talk about it with you but you know i want to i want to kind of get into the meat of it so you know that's that's what i try to do I will say one thing I do want to see on the channel. Uh, I want to see that uh, Water Nature Fire mid-range. Yeah. That's my favorite deck. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It's just, it's kind of just... The, the, the strategy is just so dynamically different from Bombazar. Yeah. You know, it's, it's less aggressive, it's more thought out, it's more paced. You get to really sort of explore... Uh, what those colors have to offer yeah. because it is it's a cool combination of colors I yeah like it it's, it's one of the few decks too that is can actually play a mid-range strategy in this game too because most dual master decks fall into either an aggro or control strat and very few decks can play the mid-range game effectively because control tends to blow out all of the mid-range decks and aggro tends to kind of get over on control a lot of the time mm -hmm. Uh, are the good aggressive strategies so yeah it's it's interesting and that's another thing uh, 
to touch on real quick. Uh, one of the comments that really stuck out uh, from the uh, Rub Control versus Fire Nature Aggro match, um, uh, you know, Aggro usually wins that matchup. And I th- that's what you saw in that match was the result of optimization in this game. Yes. Um, we had a 40-card control strategy. We saw the cards that were relevant when we needed to see them because we were playing such a small account. And, you know, even even something like Locomotiver that's really, you know, not super dangerous on its own, coming out of shields like that, taking a card, when you're already low on resources like aggro decks tend to be, and being able... I have the hiccups, I'm sorry. To uh, trade with your opponent's creatures like that is a big deal. And you see things like that happen more often and in a more relevant way when you play a more optimal version of the game. Yeah. So, and that's, and, and to put it on its head too, like, most times, like, that whole triangle of archetypes or, um, where, where you have, you know, aggro, mid-range, and control... And, you know, from, from, a, from a magic standpoint, for those of you who play Magic the Gathering, you know, aggro tends to beat control, control tends to beat midrange, midrange tends to beat aggro. And that's the, that's the triangle there. And, you know, of course that's not set in stone. Like, those deck types don't always beat those other deck types, and there's tons of ways to tech each deck so that they have better matchups based on a meta. But, you know, that tends to be the way it goes. And in Duel Masters things kind of got flipped on their head a little bit because we don't have the ability to play out of a main phase two because we don't have a way to interact with our opponents on our turn uh, or on their turn um, you know dual masters kind of takes advantage of that and flips that uh that uh was it a paradigm yeah I don't know. flips that on its head more or less so it, it's interesting to see, and, that and was like a correct use of the word, by the way. Yeah, and and like Gorby said, you know, it's it's these we're beginning to optimize our decks now, and control in an optimized form, you know, with a lot of anti-aggro uh, techs beats aggro. <laughs> you know, it, I don't know how well, you know, obviously that rub control would do very poorly against a greedier rub control because you know they're both playing a slow game and that greedier one can probably just get over on the other but um in that little vacuum that deck was teched for the anti-aggro mid-range decks and can kind of get over on them because of it so so that was you know that that pretty much i think does it i think we've exhausted all the topics that i think we wanted to talk about um like I said, you know, stay tuned for more. We'll, you'll be seeing a lot more of that uh, fire or uh, water nature. I, I can't ever say the colors in the right order. But anyways, that uh, that aggressive uh, twin cannon strategy, yes. you know, water, fire nature. I do want to play more of that because, like you said, I, I like the deck a lot. So I, I'd like to pit it up against a lot of different decks and see how it does. Um, you'll be seeing a lot more Marino, a lot more foul control. Um... Balam control, which is something we'll start messing around with, and then a uh, light fire rush. So I'm staying looking out for all those matches. I think I'm going to stick to probably instead of two a day, one every other day um, for the next couple of weeks. I think what we do is we record a lot in the span of like two days, and then just kind of spread them out and upload them over the course of like two to three weeks. So, um, you know, if you're commenting on things and expecting to see things in a timely manner, like I said, I'll try to get to it all in the comments. You know, I like to respond to you guys there to interact with you guys in that way. But a lot of our content production only gets done once every like two to three weeks. So um, just be aware of that, you know, when you are commenting on videos that we can't just update things on the fly. Um, you know, most of the content is already created ahead of time. So just a heads up there. But yeah, let us know what you think. Uh, you know, Thanks for hanging in there, those of you who made it the full hour and eight minutes or so. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, I enjoy doing these. I, I like talking to you guys. And like I said, you know, for those of you who want to have a dialogue back with us, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to, you know, respond to you in the comments. Please leave them below because that's why I'm doing this. You know, I, I really just kind of wanted to get back into the YouTube game. I wanted to make some, you know, some content again and you guys have made it you know all the worthwhile because i just didn't expect this type of response you know when i did start uploading so uh keep it coming guys y'all are amazing and uh
Yeah, I guess from us here, from me and this guy. Me? Yeah, I guess we'll see you guys next time. Beach. Beach.